So uh, last time I kind of zipped through a number of calculations. Uh, partly the reason for that is that uh, I like to uh, focus on things that are more conceptual and the calculations are typically a way of reaching something that is uh, uh, more uh, interesting and conceptual, so don't uh, worry about it too much. So uh, let's uh, sort of uh, go back and uh, take a look at something that is uh, uh, more uh, relevant and conceptual. Uh, so basically, let's go through what we said in the first lecture we would like to do, which is to understand the elements of the fluctuation in these forces. And uh, the first thing was that we would have a fluctuating medium. And uh, so, for example, these objects have been immersed in some white material that is fluctuating. And uh, what is fluctuating could have thermal origin. So you can imagine that these objects are immersed either, say, in an oil-water mixture, in a liquid crystal, in a superfluid. There are all kinds of things that you can imagine. And then there is uh, also quantum versions of that. Why is it that I think about quantum as fluctuating? Well, if you think that there is just electromagnetic field there, because of quantum mechanics, you can't say that both electric and magnetic field are simultaneously zero because they are governed by some uncertainty principle like position and momentum. So one of them has to be non-zero and there's all of these fluctuations that are uh, going on. And uh, in all of these cases, and also later on, maybe we will start to think about systems that are out of equilibrium, which makes it more difficult and a challenge to think about uh, uh, forces, but uh, in all of these cases, then we have immersed in this fluctuating object obstacles. And these obstacles constrain fluctuations. So basically, this system, the white stuff was fluctuating and you put this uh, barriers and when you get uh, close to the barriers, the fluctuations have to be modified. And so somehow the system feels constrained. Uh, it either likes it or it doesn't like it. it in uh, some way or other, these modifications mean that uh, you need either more room or less room for your fluctuations. And because of that, you either push or pull these objects together, creating various types of forces. Okay. Now, the thing that we said is to a large extent, I can figure out what these forces are just from uh, thinking about uh, what the fluctuations were and how they are modified. So if we are dealing with thermal or quantum, the source of fluctuations for thermal are certainly KT. Uh, the source of uh, fluctuations for uh, quantum are H bar. And depending on the medium, if I have an electromagnetic field, uh, some characteristic uh, speed has to show up. And uh, then I say, OK, uh, force has dimensions of energy per length. So uh, whatever. Uh, force I have in the system should have this characteristic behavior. Over here, it has to be h squared because of the additional thing. Now, the difficulty that I mentioned briefly last time is that, in principle, you don't have one length scale in the system. I'm kind of implying that this is the separation of the objects. But potentially, uh, the object has some characteristic size. It has some characteristic uh, frequencies and resonances that you can uh, translate into length scales. And so in principle, this is actually much more complicated. Similarly over here. 
So in order to gain one level of insight, let's try to uh, simplify the problem so that we don't have any of these additional things. So for the case of electromagnetism, maybe we can think of something that is a perfect mirror. Polymers were nice if we said that essentially uh, the polymers uh, uh, just uh, feel a hard obstacle. Uh, there could still be additional length scale. Let's say for polymer, you have to worry about persistence length and things like that. But imagine that we remove all of these things. And one way to remove this uh, uh, scale dependence is to sort of focus on the type of objects that I have indicated over there that are uh, scale invariant entities. So if I don't have any additional length scales in the problem, then the force has to have this form and some amplitude, which is a number. And that amplitude potentially could depend on shape and geometry, like the angle of this object. But something that is uh, in a very uh, good sense universal, and you should be able to calculate from uh, some uh, uh, perspectives. So the aspect of uh, this uh, uh, story that was part of what I was saying now is that the shape is important because that shape determines this amplitude. Uh, but there is another aspect that I started to uh, do calculations for, and uh, that was uh, boundary conditions. And uh, again, this amplitude potentially for a given medium depends on how the fluctuations are modified when they touch the obstacle. And we will focus to some extent on the importance of that. And partly I mentioned that last time around in the context of polymers, whether the boundary condition that the polymer was facing from the obstacle corresponded to something Dirichlet that the polymer could not penetrate or something that corresponded to a, a Neumann which corresponded to a, a gradient being zero that we had to interpret what the meaning of that is. Okay, so let me briefly go back to the story of polymers. Of course, one can start thinking about realistic situations where you are pulling a polymer away from a surface uh, using the tip of an atomic force microscope, for example, which at some range of length scales you can think of as being scale invariant. Uh, but the kind of models that I'm going to use with uh, focus on entropic elasticity are kind of uh, different from that. Uh, but let me sort of mention one thing that I uh, probably didn't emphasize enough last time, which is imagine that you have this polymer that is attached to the tip, and on the other side there is a surface, but the surface is attracting the polymer. Okay? So if the tip was not pulling it away, the uh, polymer would be sitting and exploring the surface because there is an energy gain by being on the surface. And of course, what is uh, trying to push the polymer away is that there is some entropy, and if it certainly goes to three-dimensional space, it has more room to explore and more entropy. And so there is essentially a free energy, uh, which is presumably a free energy that is extensive per unit length of the polymer. And if this uh, atomic force microscope is pulling away uh, the polymer from the surface, Clearly, the cost that it has to pay has to do removing that free energy per unit length. So if it pulls a certain length, uh, that free energy is lost, and therefore uh, the force that it has to experience is related to the free energy per unit length. And as I approach the transition where the polymer gets desorbed, this free energy uh, goes to zero, 
and the way that it goes to zero I have indicated as being inversely proportional to some characteristic length scale. Okay? And so basically when you are in the regime where you're absorbed, the force that has to have dimensions of kT over characteristic length, the characteristic length is this length scale that corresponds to uh, correlation lengths that uh, are bound to the uh, surface. Now, as I said, when the entropy becomes sufficiently more important, this correlation length goes to infinity, and then the other length that I have to worry about is the separation of the tip to the surface, and then I would have this uh, dimension uh, less form that I mentioned over here uh, with some amplitude kT over the separation. Okay. The other thing that I mentioned last time is that if I'm just considering the entropy and these are rigid obstacles, then the way that I would calculate what this amplitude is is by once having postulated that this is the form of the force, I calculate the work to pull away the object from touching the surface all the way to infinity. And that work is the integral of uh, this force against the displacement. Uh, force being uh, inversely in the displacement, I get a logarithmic divergence. And by postulating that the radius of gyration of a typical polymer scales as the number of monomers to, to this exponent mu, you get this uh, characteristic work, yes. Okay, so basically uh, when I execute a random walk, we said that uh, the likely extent of this object is uh, n to the one-half, which more realistic polymers, this n to the one-half becomes n to the nu, which is around 0.6. Now, typically when I was talking about the random walk, the quantity that I was calculating was the end-to-end -end distance. But if you kind of look at this object, you can also assign to it some characteristic dimension. One way of calculating that characteristic dimension is to look at the fluctuations around the center of mass squared. And that quantity is, is uh, uh, called the radius of gyration. It doesn't matter. It's another length scale that is like this. Since in people in polymer language typically use radius of gyration because it's something that is more visual and approachable experimentally, uh, I use it interchangeably with the end-to-end -end distance, which is the quantity that I really can more easily calculate. Okay? Other questions? All right. So that's one way of calculating the work, and the other way of calculating the work is the difference in free energy of the polymer being in this location versus that location. Either one of these uh, free energies is related to the log of the partition function, and the partition function, we said that characteristically, has a part that simply is exponentially uh, growing uh, or decaying with the length of the polymer and corresponds to some kind of overall free energy per unit length of the polymer. And that quantity does not change whether you are touching the uh, surface or not. What does change is a prefactor that is uh, growing with an exponent that traditionally is indicated by gamma minus one. And depending on the constraints, you have different values of gamma. So you have one gamma that describes a polymer that is constrained to touch the tip of the cone, and one that is constrained to touch the tip of the cone that is uh, in contact with the surface. So once you sort of look at this, you can see that the non-universal part cancels out immediately, and the difference in free energy really is the difference in entropy that is due to constraints. How much does, did the constraint modify the entropy in one case as opposed to the other case? And so the difference in gamma's log n is the work which has exactly the same form as this one, allowing us to identify what the amplitude is. And there was a lot of question about uh, how the mu disappeared. Well, there is an exponent identity that relates uh, 
uh, gamma nu and some other exponent. This other exponent is related to depletion, and you can uh, calculate it using the uh, Laplacian operator, etc. Now, the calculation with the Laplacian operator is not so important. Uh, it's because it's a means of getting something that is conceptually interesting that I wanted to uh, mention. Actually, I want to go one slide further on. Because the calculation that I did over here presumed that uh, I was dealing uh, with a surface that was uh, completely rigid, but then we said that in principle, I can coat the surface with something that attracts the polymer, and so the polymer may want to be absorbed onto the surface, except at some right point, which is the desorption where the difference between energy and entropy vanishes, where uh, it wants to explore all of space, and we said that that point is also scale invariant, and really there is, as far as the Laplacian operator is concerned, two scale invariant conditions, boundary conditions, either phi is zero or gradient of phi is zero, and this one corresponds to the gradient of phi uh, equals to zero, and we can do some corresponding calculation, calculate amplitudes in this case. And so once you have the amplitudes, you can calculate what the forces are in the different conditions. So what I wanted to do was to emphasize something by telling you what the forces are in three circumstances. So one circumstance is when we have a cone and a plate, or a wedge and a plate, actually, since uh, I did the calculations in two dimension, and what I will plot is the two dimensional result. So we have a polymer that is excluded by both of them. And if I ask what is the amplitude of the force, the one that we had, it clearly is going to depend on this opening angle, uh, which I call big theta. And clearly, the range of interest is where theta goes from 0 all the way to uh, being maximally open, which is pi over 2. Okay. And for this circumstance, the value of the amplitude that I will call A is 3 pi squared, uh, 2 pi minus theta, pi minus 2 theta. That's something that I calculated last time for you. Uh, if I put theta equals to zero, then I start with one and a half. So I start over here. At pi over four, you can check that it reaches around four, and then it diverges. So this circumstance corresponds to an amplitude that kind of looks like this. Okay, why is that interesting? Well, uh, then let's uh, look at a couple of other cases. Let's imagine that this surface I covered with something that uh, attracts the polymer, and I went to write the transition. So I have Dirichlet Neumann, and so the polymer now sometimes likes to touch this surface. Then the resulting amplitude that I will call A prime is uh, pi squared divided by 2 pi minus theta pi minus 2 theta. So in this case, I start at one half, 
and then it kind of goes to around four thirds and then diverges. And finally, I can imagine the circumstance where it is the cone that is uh, uh, giving me the Dirichlet boundary condition versus the surface that is uh, uh, repulsive. And here the amplitude is simple. It is a double prime is pi squared, two pi, sorry, pi minus two theta. And so this uh, must be pi. Kind of starts over here and is intermediate between these curves. Now, finally, I said that there is a circumstance in which both of these objects are at their Dirichlet condition. And then Dirichlet condition is something that having balanced energy and entropy, essentially the particle, uh, the polymer doesn't see either surface. It feels effectively no constraint. And so the force is zero. Yes. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, because what we are calculating here is partition functions and free energies. So that's irrespective of what the dynamics is. Okay, so when I calculate partition functions, I include all configurations. So stuck on the surface means that I still have to explore all configurations on the surface. Now it is true that if I only have configurations on the surface and I don't allow it to come up, I'm always going to be in the bound state. So if I want to have a lattice version of this polymer, uh, maybe on the surface I would have sites on which I move but I have to allow it to go in the third dimensions also, okay? And if I calculate the entropy or some cal uh, partition function for that system, again, uh, for getting dynamics, all of this story holds. Other questions? Okay. So the, the morale and why I went through all of this was that boundary conditions are important. And by playing around with different types of boundary condition, and in particular, it would be nice to always deal with scale invariant boundary conditions, we can modify the amplitude of the forces that we are dealing with, okay? Now, shortly, I'm going to tell you that that is going to be very important in dealing with the Casimir force, so maybe I will uh, go to that. So we are leaving the world of polymers. Are there any questions about it? Okay. So we discussed uh, this polymeric force that to all intents and purposes has the same characteristics as the Casimir force, except that it's kT over h rather than h bar c over h squared. But one very important difference is that uh, all of these amplitudes were positive. So I could weaken it, but I didn't succeed in making it attractive. Whereas when we are talking about the Casimir force, it's an attractive interaction. Okay? And so one of the things that is interesting to think about and for which I really don't have any particular insight is why the force uh, for electromagnetism is uh, attractive, could it potentially be repulsive, and that's some of the things that we are going to be exploring. So as I mentioned, this force has been experimentally uh, looked at and is uh, supposed to be a problem 
in constructing devices that are operating at micron scale involving conductors that have to move around. And the reason for that is that if the motion brings two pieces of conductor close to each other, this force diverging and close approach becomes very strong, causes the pieces to stick together and your uh, uh, machine fails. So because of that, there was a challenge for a while to try to think about a means of doing something similar to the, this to make the uh, quantum Casimir force weaker or potentially even hopefully make it uh, repulsive. Now, the lesson that we learned from polymers is that boundary conditions are important. So let's uh, ask the question from the simplest quantum calculation that we made, which gave us an attractive force, whether modifying boundary conditions can change the story. So let me remind you what was that simplest uh, quantum calculation that we made. It was uh, looking at a 1D interval. So I had a system that was extended between zero and let's call it H. We had the electromagnetic field, which we could actually replace with two scalar fields that was uh, fluctuating in between. And most importantly, we imposed the boundary condition that the field uh, was zero at the two ends. Okay. Now we said that boundary conditions are important. So let's modify this and do the Neumann boundary condition on one side and the Dirichlet boundary condition on the other side. So this is the important modification that we are going to make. Okay, how does it modify the calculation? Well, essentially the modes that you have to deal with are modes that don't go zero to both ends but come with uh, finite gradients. So the corresponding wave numbers that you are dealing with are uh, 2n minus 1 uh, pi over 2h. So that essentially if I write uh, sine of uh, 2n minus 1 pi x over 2h, at x equals to 0, I always will have a 0. At x equals to h, I will have a multiple of 2 pi, which gives me a 0 gradient an odd multiple of 2 pi. Okay, so then all we need to do is to repeat the calculation uh, that we did before. So we had that the ground state energy was the sum over all of the modes uh, of uh, h bar omega over 2. And this is h bar uh, well, omega is going to be C times Qn, so I will have C over 2, and I will have uh, a Qn, which is this form. The important part is pi over H, and then I have a sum over N, and whereas in the calculation that I had done with two Dirichlet conditions, I had that's it. The difference, because I have the uh, uh, Neumann boundary condition on the other side is that this n becomes n minus 1. Okay? So that's, that's it. So what is this? Uh, well, it is uh, h bar c over h. I have pi over 2. And then I have two of these infinite sums. One of them is the one that we had for uh, the usual a Dirichlet case, and we have now just another one, which is the sum of the one-halves that is subtracted. And now you know how to do all of these infinite sums, and you know that this sum 
has a finite part which is minus 112, while this has a finite part that is minus 1 half. Okay. So suddenly the minus 1 half minus 1 half becomes a plus 1 quarter which overwhelms the minus 1 twelfth that I had previously. So the answer becomes uh, positive. It becomes plus h bar c over h and I have uh, pi over 12. Okay. Which means that the force that I will get which is the derivative of e with respect to h well, I have minus and the derivative of 1 over h will give me another minus, so it is becoming plus h bar c over h squared pi over 12. Okay? So suddenly, with this calculation, we see that the sign changed from Dirichlet Dirichlet that was attractive to Dirichlet Neumann that is repulsive. And you can, as an exercise, do the corresponding calculation in three dimensions, just repeating what we had before, essentially replacing everywhere sum over n's with sum over n, n minus one half, whatever power, actually, in three dimensions, we would have something like this. And you find that the final answer for the Casimir force in three dimensions is uh, h bar, so a Casimir pressure because it's force per unit area, is h bar c over h uh, to the, well, it's like, let, let me just write the energy. Per unit area is h bar c over h cubed, and again, seven pi squared, 180, as opposed to minus one o pi squared over 240 that we had before. So it becomes uh, repulsive, okay? So the prediction is that <coughs> the Casimir force can indeed be made repulsive provided that I arrange boundary conditions so that on one side I'm experiencing something that is equivalent to Dirichlet and on the other side, I experience something that is equivalent to Neumann. And you say, well, okay, should I believe any of this? And the answer is you can experimentally manage that. And the way that you would need to do that is rather than having vacuum in between your two mediums, so basically we have uh, one surface here, and then typically we were looking at the interaction between two surfaces that were the same, but I will use two surfaces, two bounding surfaces that are different, and rather than having vacuum in between, I will put some other material in between so that the dielectric response here is big, something like a metal. The dielectric response here is uh, uh, small, and the dielectric response here is intermediate between the two, okay? And then if you look at how the electromagnetic field reflects at the two boundaries, these are, again, the type of calculation that you do in optics and uh, you know that the response of the electromagnetic field, the way that it uh, reflects or reflect, uh, refracts depends on uh, which medium has the larger di dielectric response. So if you translate that to the language that we have, going from a weak to strong dielectric corresponds to a Dirichlet boundary condition which would be then here oppo opposite that because I'm going from a weak to a weaker. So that's going to give me something that is effectively like a Neumann boundary condition. So in these circumstances, I expect uh, that uh, the natural tendency of fluctuations is to 
push away these two objects. And something that, again, you probably have seen in experiments yourself is that uh, if I were to uh, have uh, uh, glass surface, then a film of helium likes to run up it. And one way of interpreting it, you can sort of cast it in terms of van der Waals, et cetera, is that the dielectric constant of helium is intermediate between glass and air. Okay? And so I if you want to sort of have a wetting situation in which we thicken this film of helium. Now, a more dramatic version of that experiment was done a few years ago by the group of Capasso at uh, Harvard, where uh, uh, what they had was uh, the material here, they had gold, so that's the substrate. The intermediate object was an oil, a bromobenzene, and then they had a sphere of silica, so again, that set of uh, dielectric responses holds. And there, it, the what was dramatic is that essentially the a uh, sphere was lifted, it was held up by this repulsive Casimir force. So these manipulations with boundaries, etc., are indeed relevant and they tell you what is going on and you can do this. Now, this particular approach is not very useful if you are trying to build these microelectromechanical machines because you have fabricated this very nice delicate object and you want it to nicely move around, you don't pour a lot of oil on it. It kind of spoils what you want to do. Uh, so the ideal thing that you want to do is to achieve this over uh, uh, the case of uh, uh, vacuum. And so I'll come to that shortly. Uh, I wanted to also measure, uh, mention that this story of different dielectric, uh, different boundary conditions, we could also repeat for the thermal case. We mentioned this experiment of uh, uh, Bechinger group uh, that calculated the fluctuation induced force, uh, uh, that, uh, the critical fluctuation induced force. Uh, now they can manipulate boundary conditions also. In the case of those colloids, it amounts to putting either hydrophobic or hydrophilic elements on the two surfaces involved. And depending on how they do these manipulations, they can make the force either uh, repulsive or attractive so that you can rearrange the colloidal particles using these uh, fluctuation induced forces on top of the object. Okay, but I said that really the challenge was to somehow make uh, uh, the Casimir force to be uh, repulsive when the intermediate thing is just vacuum. So one reason people thought that it was possible is a calculation that goes back to 1974 to Boyer. So the electromagnetic field, of course, has two components. And whereas here I have been focusing on the role of the dielectric constant epsilon, there is also the magnetic permeability also mu. And so Boyer did this uh, simple calculation in which there was just vacuum in between. On one side, he had a material that was a perfect conductor, essentially corresponding to epsilon going to infinity. And on the other side, let's, set, let's imagine that I have a boundary that corresponds to the magnetic response going to infinity. Okay? And when he did the corresponding calculations, such as the ones that I have over here, he found that in this case, you also get uh, repulsive interaction. Now, in uh, uh, materials that we see around us, we don't have a strong uh, mu goes to infinity uh, type of system. So people suggested that maybe we can fool the material to have that kind of response by creating what is called a metamaterial. What's a metamaterial? You take some 
underlying things such as silicon and on top of it you design this pattern with gold or some other metallic subs, uh, object that has some particular shape here in the form of circles and you can very well imagine that if I now try to uh, put a magnetic field in the system there will be currents that will be running through these loop like objects and they would kind of uh, uh, respond back on the magnetic field and so maybe this is a material that at least in some range of frequencies would have a strong response that would kind of mimic this. So people were very excited that somehow these mater metal materials can be uh, used to uh, uh, create uh, repulsion. And let's see if this comes up. The new scientist. I like the way that they start. Uh, it sounds like science fiction joke, but it isn't. What do you get when you uh, turn an invisibility cloak on its side, a mini flying carpet? Okay, the mini flying carpet is this idea of repulsion and uh, levitation, and the invisibility cloak is because these mat metal materials have also been proposed as a way of uh, shielding uh, and having electromagnetic field go around so there is this uh, idea that maybe this this will work so that's one of the stories that we are going to uh, talk about all right so keep that possibility in mind but now i want to go back to what I had. We had two elements that we said we were manipulating. One of them was boundary conditions, which is what I was discussing here, and the other was shape. As I said, the uh, fluctuation induced force is not something that is pairwise. It knows about the entire boundary. So potentially you may wonder whether the shape of the object is important. and. Uh, uh, there is a very nice story as to why people thought that maybe uh, they could uh, change the shape of the object and get repulsion. And uh, the story goes back to something that Casimir called a mouse trap. What was his mouse trap? Well, we know that the electron causes an electric field, and if we calculate the electric field uh, falls off as one over R squared, if we integrate it, and if we have a sphere of some characteristic size R, just classical calculation, how much energy have uh, we stored by having a charge E, the answer is going to be E squared over R is the amount of electrostatic energy that you have just because you have a charge and it creates fields all over space. Now, you say, but R for an electron is going to zero. So there is an infinite amount of energy that is involved here. That's problematic. And so that has been an issue for trying to build a classical model of electron, which probably was not a nice thing to do in any way, but that that existed and so there was this difficulty. Now Casimir said that whenever I put a perfect conductor such as my parallel plates, uh, they modified the electromagnetic fluctuations and I found that there was a corresponding change in the amount of fluctuation energy that was stored. And uh, Let's imagine what that change is going to be in this case, just on dimensional arguments. Well, we've said that everything has to be proportional to h bar c, and if I want to create some energy, I have to divide h bar c by a length scale, and the only length scale that I have for this model is one over r. So I know that this is a repulsive energy, the electron charge is all the same sign, wants to explode. 
I know that typically Casimir energies are attractive, so maybe if I can calculate the corresponding amplitude over here, such as the ones that I erased, for the case of a sphere, let's call it B, then I have two objects that scale as 1 over R, and in principle, I can arrange B to precisely cancel uh, E squared over H bar C. And so I have a way, and this was his mousetrap, of capturing what the fine structure constant is. Okay? So he said, all I need to do is to really do this calculation uh, of the change in the energy of the modes for the case of a sphere. I have done it for parallel plates. If I kind of estimate something based on parallel plates and curve them, etc., I don't get such a bad value. I guess I call this A rather than B for uh, what uh, uh, this uh, uh, fine structure constant should be. Okay, so the story goes that uh, uh, in uh, 1960s, uh, Coleman was giving these lectures at Harvard on field theory that were very popular, and uh, uh, one of the students in the audience was uh, Boyer, whose name we already saw in con uh, context of the new goes to infinity story, and he said, okay, I'm going to do this calculation. It's a very hard calculation to calculate all of the modes and do the corresponding things that we did for this geometry. He did that, but Unfortunately for him, he found that the value of the constant here is negative, okay? which means that if you want to interpret it, it's in the same direction as the uh, energy of the positive charge that wants to explode the whole thing. Okay? So there was sort of the origin that somehow once you do these calculations, potentially the answer that you get depends on uh, uh, the, value, uh, the type of geometry that you are dealing with. And somebody earlier asked me about the case where what if you have a case where not one dimension can be treated as infinite and the other one as finite, but all of the dimensions are finite, so you have to do multiple sums rather than one of them being an integral. And so that kind of calculation, in some sense, is easier to do than for the sphere. And once you do that, you find that depending on the ratios of the dimensions, you can make this overall coefficient that depends on the ratios of these terms to have either positive sign or negative sign. Okay? Now, these types of calculation gave rise to this perspective that maybe by changing the shapes, maybe by uh, drawing uh, grooves that had the appropriate uh, type of dimensions, we can create a situation in which the Casimir force of electromagnetism becomes repulsive. And uh, uh, now the difficulty with the calculation over here is that indeed it is true that what uh, Boyer uh, calculated was that there was a change uh, in the uh, energy of zero-point fluctuations that if I were to change R would correspond to something that is repulsive and wants to make it bigger. Now, somehow people interpreted that, that if I were to take that, and if I were to cut the sphere in half, then that would cause the two parts of the sphere to go away from each other. But clearly, that's a very different calculation. And why you are forced to think about that geometry as opposed to just changing R is because in no physical situation can you just change R. If you have a material uh, that is a solid sphere and you try to ex uh, change R, then you have uh, changed the separation between atoms and you have to uh, give a huge cost. Even if you have a balloon and you blow the balloon up, then you have the surface tension to deal with. So there are all of these divergences that we kind of threw away in the parallel plate geometry, 
you cannot throw them away over here. There is volume energy, there is surface energy, all of those things are much, much more important than this uh, one over R dependence. But if you could potentially cut it, then the surface area, the volume, etc., hopefully will not change. And people thought, well, maybe that would uh, do this. But once you do actually calculations similar to that, which are not uh, so easy, you find that no, the two halves of the sphere will actually stick to each other and attract each other. If you were able to do the calculation uh, for uh, 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 half sphere, which actually nobody has done, what has been done is a much more powerful theorem that was uh, proved by uh, Click, which is that uh, if you have uh, two objects that are mirror symmetric across some mirror plane, no matter what the shape of the object is, the Casimir interaction between them will be attractive. Okay? Now, for this kind of hypercubes, uh, we did a different calculation. So that's the sphere. Uh, the calculation that we did was we said, okay, one way to get rid of uh, problems that you have with surface and volume is to imagine that you have one of these cylinders, not cylinders, but hyper, uh, by parallelopipeds, and put a piston in the middle. So then you have one side, the other side, that are parallelopipeds, and you could potentially manipulate these parallelopipeds so that individually one of them has uh, a positive, the other has energy, both of them have positive, etc. It doesn't matter. What you find is that if this piston can slide, clearly there's no worry about changes in volume or sp surface area. But what you find in this case, it is uh, certainly it is sometimes true that this is going to be repelled by this side, but then it is attracted by that side and just goes and sticks to one side. So the object will stick to one side or the other side. So question of whether you are repelled by one side is kind of meaningless because you are in some sense more strongly attracted by the other side. You would say that the real question that I'm going to face is whether I can find a stable equilibrium position for this object. Okay? And I hope that that question reminds you of the following. known as Enshaw's theorem. And uh, it's something that hopefully you have seen. It's certainly discussed in Feynman's book. And uh, it's the question of whether or not by manipulating some col uh, collection of plus and minus charges in space, you can hold another uh, plus or minus charge uh, in uh, stable equilibrium, levitate. And uh, so Earnshaw had some result about that. And I really like the first paragraph of uh, Earnshaw's paper, so I'll read it to you. It says, uh, there are already before the world by various authors several memoirs which collaterally or incidentally embrace the subject of the present communication, which is this levitation and stable equilibrium. There is observable in them, however, much disagreement of results, which seems chiefly to arise from the extreme length and complexity of the investigations by which those results are obtained, how you put your charges around, for example, and in our case, by thinking in terms of these metamaterials or these complex shapes, to avoid which as much as possible, the authors are compelled to adopt means of simplification, which we cannot always be certain a priori are sufficiently approximative. In the following pages, the subject will be found to be treated in a manner perfectly new and direct, and it is also hoped satisfactory. So uh, it's really a single uh, two-line computation that he proposes. He says, imagine that you have some collection of plus minus charges, etc., and somehow you have managed to hold some other object in stable equilibrium. Now, the position of this object where this 
extra charge is sitting, there is a potential that is created by everybody else, but in electrostatics, that potential is subject to Laplacian of the potential is zero. And a zero Laplacian means that the shape of the potential, if it goes up like plus x squared in one direction, it has to go down like minus uh, y squared in the opposite direction, okay? So basically, he says, no matter what you do <laughs> with this saddle type of thing, you cannot have a stable equilibrium. Okay. So question is, can we uh, show something similar holes for these fluctuation induced forces? Now, there is one simple calculation that I can do for you. Uh, I can't do the full quantum calculation in short amount of time, but I think I'm hoping that this gives you an idea of what I have in mind. Let's ask the following question. Let's replace these objects that were charged that uh, uh, Ernshaw was considering by uh, objects which are neutral, but within each object, charges can come in and out of existence and can move around. And it's not such a bad representation of fluctuating charges or currents that we have in materials. And if you like, you can even think of each one of them as containing some ionic solution in which you have ions that are dissociating, reassociating, appearing, disappearing. So you have all kinds of charges that are fluctuating in and out of existence and moving in each of these bags. Now the combination of all of these fluctuating charges is definitely going to cause some fluctuation induced interaction among all of these bags of fluctuating charges. So the question that I'm going to ask now is can I hold one of these bags of fluctuating charges in stable equilibrium through these fluctuation induced forces generated by all these other fluctuating bags, okay? So if I'm dealing with a classical system, how do I answer that question? Well, the analog of the potential that Ernshaw was dealing with is a free energy that depends on the positions of all of these bags. After I have integrated out all of the fast degrees of freedom, which are all of these charges. So what I need to do is to calculate a partition function that integrates out all of these fluctuating degrees of freedom and then takes its log and multiply by kT so that I get the free energy that depends, let's say, on the location and orientations of these bags. Uh, okay, an important part of the energy over here is the electrostatic energy that operates between all of these charges that come in and out of existence. So uh, there is one component of this Hamiltonian that depends on these uh, charges and their coordinate separation, but there are certainly lots of other things potentially uh, in this uh, uh, energy cost that I have to integrate, including the boundaries of the bags that uh, prevent the charges from uh, going outside. Okay, the analog of the Laplacian of phi of N Shaw is to then take the Laplacian of this free energy if I were to make a change in the position of one of these bags that I want to hold in stable equilibrium. Now, taking derivatives of log partition functions is something that we know how to do in statistical physics. And essentially, it gives me two terms. One of them is that the second derivative either acts directly on this Laplacian, and then I have to take the average of that, or really because of the way that the log appears, I will take the gradient and then I have to uh, do some manipulations. I think uh, that was some of it was in Jorge's uh, 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 lecture. You end up having to deal with the variance of the gradient, which is the force. So the first part, the Laplacian of uh, H, if I were to make this variation, is governed by Laplace's equation and what Ernshaw had. This is zero, okay? The second part, I don't know how to calculate the forces, but fortunately, I don't need to. All I need to do is to know the variance of the force, and I know what the sign of the variance is. 
So essentially, I'm sure that this quantity is negative, which means that the system with fluctuating objects is less stable than the one that has no fluctuations. And if you like, what that amounts to is that in principle here, you could be sitting right on the saddle, but fluctuations will kind of move you around and you're more likely to fall off. Okay? So that's very simple. Now, it took us a long while and it's not an easy thing, but we managed to pro prove the analog of this result for the quantum Casimir force subject to a number of constraints. One of the most important constraints was that uh, in order to, do, uh, to prove our theorem, we had to suppose that each one of these objects, the, its electromagnetic response was characterized by a classical dielectric function, epsilon, which is a function of x and omega. So uh, dielectric functions can, in principle, vary with frequency. They can vary arbitrarily with frequency. There are kramers kronig and other kinds of constraints that they have to satisfy, which are also important for establishing our theorem. But in principle, this dielectric can vary across space. So this theorem covers the metamaterials. The metamaterials are objects where epsilon is either epsilon of silicon or epsilon of gold is varying across space. And uh, what we've shown is that given that condition, then the second derivative of the energy of the Casimir, quantum Casimir interaction with respect to these displacements is uh, uh, negative also, ruling out the possibility, not necessarily of repulsion, but of uh, levitation and stable equilibrium using Casimir forces that are described by this. Now, of course, clearly this cannot be the final story. We know that uh, quantum mechanics allows atoms to violate uh, Enshaw's principle, the electron runs around the uh, nucleus, so that's because the response cannot be described by this at the level of atoms and molecules. So this kind of, although it has a lot of quantum mechanics, it is assuming a classical description of response. Uh, it also assumes inherently that there is some equilibrium going on, that things are not time dependent, because we all know that, for example, uh, you can uh, levitate objects using laser fields. And uh, there was something that I had here that seems to have disappeared. So imagine that picture that you don't see. And you probably, most of you have seen, this is the experiment by Geim in which there is a frog that is uh, uh, levitating in some a magnetic field. So there are various ways to avoid the conditions of uh, absence of levitation, uh, such as time dependence, being out of equilibrium, and in the case of the frog, being composed mostly of a diamagnetic material, which is water. Uh, so what I intend to do is uh, to uh, next violate this condition of equilibrium and see what happens there. So uh, I have at this point a number of uh, possibilities. I can either launch into uh, some of the description of non-equilibrium, answer some of the questions you have over here, or briefly make a diversion into something else about levitation. So let me first ask if there are questions. So we are going to finish with things that are in equilibrium. Yes. So I kind of showed you that. So um, let's go back. 
So that was levitation with quantum. Now this is an experiment that was done with uh, Bechinger. Let's see if we have more of it. All right, so you have this substrate and there are these colloidal particles that are moving on top of the substrate and you pattern the substrate to have uh, uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic segments uh, whereas the colloids are one or the other, I can't remember which. And somehow this does not want to run movies. If I were to run the movie, what you would see is that once you tune to that particular temperature where the Casimir force becomes long range because you are close to the uh, demixing point, then these things arrange themselves to levitate on top of the portions that uh, give you the repulsive interaction. So you can indeed achieve levitation in that fashion. I don't know what happened to the movies with this, but all right. Other questions? So I somehow, when we had this theorem, uh, was uh, over optimistic. I thought that there was something very much wider uh, in nature that said, quite generally, you will always have uh, absence of uh, levitation or absence more correctly of stable equilibrium point when you have these fluctuation induced forces. Now clearly all of the calculations that I have presented for you are for this Gaussian type of free field theories. And so if I wanted to sort of make a more general statement, maybe I would have to reach out to cases where we have non-interacting systems. And the oil-water mixture that we just looked at corresponds to such an interacting theory because the critical point that you have corresponds to the Ising phase transition which in three dimensions is actually very difficult to look at because you have to do these uh, uh, epsilon expansions and all of that. But in two dimensions becomes much simpler and it is not only the Ising critical point that becomes simple in two dimensions, but essentially all critical field theories in two dimensions become conformal field theories and are kind of easy to deal with. Uh, not easy to deal with, but it is possible to deal with them. So we can ask the question whether by some arrangement of shapes and some critical field theory, we can cause uh, some kind of a uh, stable point when we have put objects within some critical conformal field theory. Now, since the listing of all conformal field theories exists, we could potentially go and look at them. And also by various conformal mapping, you can distort the boundaries to have the appropriate shape that you want. And we know that you get nice results by going to these cones and the bridges. So we explore the possibility of changing the angle, see whether by changing the angle and by changing uh, the type of uh, uh, conformal field theory characterized by some parameter C that spans the Ising model, Potts model, all kinds of things, we could cause some kind of a stable point to appear. Now there is one other twist, which is that in cases of interest, we saw that we need to, to deal with boundary conditions that were not the same, but we said that we have to deal with boundary conditions that are scale invariant. So an interesting question is, well, when I have a free field theory, I said that there's two scale invariant boundary conditions, which is phi equals to zero and grad phi equals to zero. If I have some complex interacting field theory, what are the corresponding things? It turns out that there is potentially more than two, but there is a finite listing of uh, scale invariant boundary conditions that you have to impose. So our search involved not only going through all possible conformal field theories, 
all possible pairs of uh, uh, boundary conditions that were scale invariant, all possible geometries, at least as described by this angle. And eventually, in some very, very specific corner, we did find the possibility of creating shapes based on these cones and all of that uh, that would give us uh, uh, stable critical, uh, stable uh, equilibrium positions based on a combination of attraction and repulsion. So unfortunately for me, the uh, Earnshaw's theorem that I described for you does not necessarily generalize to all equilibrium field theories. So I have at least one counterexample. Okay, so let me then start with uh, what I want to be covering gradually with non-equilibrium. Okay, so I'm going to, at least not for a while, <laughs> get to the idea of uh, calculating forces, which is going to actually end up to be one of the most complicated aspects of this. Uh, but think in terms of uh, just describing fluctuations. So I sort of started everything previously by uh, looking at a fluctuating field phi made scalar but in principle you can make it vector etc all of the concepts you can sort of uh, uh, manage by thinking in terms of this field that fluctuates in space and uh, uh, the basis of what I was doing was that I had some kind of uh, uh, weight probability that was governing these fluctuations. Now I'm going to say, okay, I look at nature, I see clouds, I see all kinds of things. Maybe I see some, something that I like, like the intensity of light from the cloud, and it is fluctuating over space and time. And so I have a fluctuating object in space and time, and I want to describe that. Now, I have no a priori way of knowing why this uh, cloud is fluctuating in some particular fashion or other. I just know that I have decided to focus on this variable. And so maybe the important thing for me is to make a guess as to how that variable is changing as a function of time. And uh, I call this approach that I'm going to perform dissipative dynamics because I'm going to assume that essentially uh, the behavior of this uh, field at the next instant of time I can get from what it was at the previous time by essentially running some kind of a d phi by dt. Now that clearly is not uh, something that you would uh, write for uh, things that have inertia and uh, uh, you may want to have something that is like this, but essentially in the presence of all kinds of frictional types of things, at sufficiently long scale, all of these higher derivatives are inferior to d phi by dt, 
And if we again, in some sense, assume that there is no long-term memory, or if I have integrated to look at time scales that are beyond that memory, I can start by writing it this way. Okay, what should I put on the right side of the equation? I have no governing principle as of now. There is no Hamiltonian or energy cost that I know that is, well, there probably is some Hamiltonian that governs how the clouds are moving around, but it is too complicated. It's coupled to the wind, it is coupled to gravity, it is coupled to sun, uh, co sunlight, so there's all kinds of things uh, that are influencing that. And from my perspective, that's not a particularly useful thing to try to go and extract all of these things. So I say, on the other hand, what I'm going to do is to assume that somehow this is changing as a functional of what the field is instant, uh, at uh, this instant of time. That somehow there is some set of rules that says that if I know the field now, I would be able to figure it out at later times. I'm going to also assume, and this is where the sort of part of the Landau story comes from, is that the dynamics is kind of local. That is that the density changes here does not depend instantaneously on what happened a kilometer away. So really I should be able to uh, take care of things by including within this functional a finite number of derivatives and not too many. Okay? So this I would call is the deterministic part, but clearly things don't always follow this the pattern. I see all kinds of fluctuations. Eventually everything is probabilistic. So I assume that I would have to add here some kind of a noise. So there is a deterministic part and then there is the stochastic part. Okay. So then following lambda and I guess following Jorge, I would say I would include in this generically everything that is allowed. Because otherwise, why not? Okay? So that if I were to, for example, make this expansion and I'm going to assume that somehow I'm expanding around fluctuations with respect to whatever some average quantity is. So density above the average, fluctuating around the average. So then I'm assuming that this quantity is something that is small in the same sense that say lambda in making a uh, land of free energy, you assume that the order parameter close to the transition is a small quantity and you can make an expansion in. So generically an expansion, I would say, would have a term that starts linearly, there's a term that is quadratic, there's all kinds of terms in an expansion in a series in phi, then I will have all kinds of terms in an expansion that is a series in uh, gradient of phi or Laplacian of phi, higher powers of uh, Laplacian of phi, and all kinds of things. You notice already that uh, I hesitated a little bit because uh, I should put include everything and I didn't put a term that is gradient of phi because immediately I made at least one assumption which is that every direction in space is equivalent. And if every direction in space is equivalent, I cannot have gradient of phi unless it is uh, uh, dot producted with some vector uh, to make it into a scalar quantity. And if I don't have any specific direction in space that is selected by an isotropy or whatever, this cannot be present. So that's an example of something as why not? Well, because system is isotropic, so I cannot include that. Okay. Other than that, I will include everything in the story. 
Oh, yeah, so there will be a higher order term. So indeed, there is nothing wrong with gradient of y squared. I, I wrote terms in order of importance in an expansion in small phi and small gradient. And so then at some higher orders, I will have gradient and the field squared. So about all kinds of things, there's going to be grad phi uh, squared, Laplacian of phi, all kinds of things that are in principle known. Okay. Again, if you don't want to include something you have to tell me why not, okay? Now, as usual, the lowest order terms in the expansion are most important. And once I have this term, I have started my series with uh, d phi by dt is minus a phi and if phi is very, very small and all of the gradients are small, this is going to be leading term, immediately tells me that there is a decay over a time scale uh, which is uh, uh, one over tau, one over a, okay? And there is really no reason why this quantity a should not be some microscopic relaxation time of the system. So the generic behavior that I'm going to write down, if I follow this rule, will have some microscopic relaxation time for the fluctuation. Now, I, that's probably the most generic case, but for me it is not interesting. Why? Because all of the things that I have been telling you so far, I have been focusing on things that uh, have uh, long-range correlations in space, and in order to get long-range correlation in space, I def usually need long-range uh, relaxation times, etc. So I really want to uh, get rid of uh, microscopic time. So question is why, why not I have to find the principles that allow me to remove this term. And we've already seen some of those principles uh, because they're even operating in equilibrium. So how do, for example, uh, going back to the experiments of uh, Behringer, how did he manage to grade these long-range interactions? Because he tuned temperature so that he went to the critical point where oil and water were demixed, and you had long correlation lengths. In the land or language, essentially all of the parameters, A, B, etc., that I have, are functions of external things, such as temperature, pressure, blah, blah, blah. And so if I manipulate external parameters, such as what Bechinger did by changing temperature, you can in principle hit a critical temperature so that this parameter has vanished, okay? And then the microscopic time has disappeared and you have to deal with say, times associated with critical fluctuations. But I don't particularly like this because I, this needs tuning. And if I just give you some random systems, I would say that this is not generic. It should be there. Okay. Now, you say, well, let's think about all of the things that we have covered. We were talking today about the uh, polymer story, about the uh, about the uh, electromagnetic Casimir force. Uh, earlier I had talked about the experiments of Moses Chen and the superfluid phonons. There they were seeing things not at a particular temperature. Quantum uh, Casimir force is long range <laughs> always. So what is happening there? Well, the thing that is happening there is a symmetry. <laughs> 
which is a very important principle. And the symmetry, let's say, for the case of phonons that are described by uh, a scalar field, the phonons of the superfluid, is that if you were to change the phase infinitesimally, so if you take phi of x and you replace it with phi of x plus some amount, nothing should change. So the dynamics does not depend on the field itself. So what I would need is that this quantity that I call V, V of phi of x plus epsilon should be the same as V of phi of x. Okay. Now, under this transformation, gradients don't change. The gradient maps, maps it itself. But phi changed. So if I have this symmetry, I cannot have an explicit dependence of uh, the thing that I'm expanding on phi. So this symmetry principle, if I have, provides me the why not to eliminate this whole set of things. Okay. So if that is the case, then you can see that my equation at the lowest order, rather than starting with something that is proportional to phi, it has isotropy, cannot have gradient, has to start with Laplacian of phi. It's not generically there. Some systems possess it. Most systems don't possess it. The electromagnetic field has a gauge symmetry. Who said you should have the gauge symmetry? If I'm growing a surface and gravity is not important, then the dynamics when it has grown to one meter is the same as the dynamics if it is already two meters below it. It doesn't know that it is two meters below it, so it cannot depend on the height. It can only depend on variations of the height. That system has that symmetry. But on the other hand, if I'm drawing a thing that has weight and gravity is important, maybe it matters that I'm already at one meter or at two meters. So some systems possess this symmetry, and then generically I have to start that way. Some point um, don't. So I have to say, why not? Okay. Now, once this happens, you can see that the characteristic relaxation times are no longer microscopic, but if I'm looking at a system of some characteristic size L, the characteristic relaxation times would be macroscopic L squared, for example. And then this is certainly at the level of the linear theory. Uh, you can worry about all of those higher order terms that we had. Those higher order terms potentially could be relevant, maybe even change this exponent, but they don't modify the fact that you would have uh, relaxation times that are set by macroscopic scales as opposed to microscopic scales. Now, both of these situations apply in equilibrium. We would like to go cases out of equilibrium and find additional principles, and that's what I will do starting next time.